everybody. Uh, welcome to the Daiwa Anglo-Japanese Foundation. My name is Jason James and I'll be chairing today. So there are three of us uh, doing this today. Uh, I'm in Cambridge, as I mentioned. Um, Sophie Williamson is currently in a cave in Cappadocia in Turkey, uh, but she doesn't always live in a cave in Turkey. Um, and then Andrew Merkel is in Tokyo. And I'll just briefly introduce the two speakers. Um, so Andrew Merkel is a writer, editor and translator uh, in Tokyo. He is the editorial director of the Agency for Cultural Affairs' Art Platform Japan translation project. And he's also the deputy editor of Art IT uh, International Edition. And he teaches at Tokyo University of the Arts and is working on a book of translations of Kishio Suga. And then uh, our other speaker or discussant is Sophie J. Williamson, who is a curator based in London, uh, and she is program curator at Camden Arts Centre. Um, and she has relatively recently published a, an anthology called Translation um, and is developing her research further. And as you can see, her research is quite complicated, so we're going to rely on Sophie herself to explain it to us. And then the next slide is just a rough timeline. So that was my introduction. Uh, we'll have a discussion for about 40 minutes between Sophie and Andrew, and then we'll open it up to questions. Um, and that might run on a little past one o'clock, depending on how many questions we get. So over to our two speakers, and I think Sophie is going to kick us off. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, so um, we've got a lot to talk about. Um, and Andrew and I have been sharing um, texts and ideas over the last couple of months. But we were invited to do this um, talk about translation because of each of our research in various different aspects of that field. Um, um, so as you just heard, I, I made this anthology last year that were brought together um, different artists and poets um, and theorists and writers around the subject of translation. Um, and that wasn't just thinking about linguistic translation, but about how ideas um, might be translated across um, different cultures and different environments and across different eras and how artworks can be translated and transformed. Um, and that research has really, um, for me, developed this year during my sabbatical into thinking about how we translate meaning over deep time. So thinking about how translation operates um, between individuals and between communities and how we might use that to translate meaning over much longer extended periods of time. Um, so the conversations that Andrew and I have been having have really been centered on um, the work that he's been doing around um, his translation of Kishio Suga's work. Um, and those texts, as Andrew will, will um, lead us through, are very um, dense with meaning and interpretation. So I must admit, first of all, that I don't speak a word of Japanese and I have been completely dependent on Andrew's translations of the texts. Um, so I think we'll talk a bit about how those texts are, um, have been translated and the ways that they kind of operate in different ways. And um, I know Andrew has some really wonderful thoughts about the kind of um, subjectivities and challenges that translating texts such as these has, um, particularly in terms of translating these kind of very dense and cryptic and very thoughtful um, uh, proposals that um, Suga writes. Um, so I think that during the talk we will, um, we've structured it around five different texts, um, around five different ideas, and um, the process is going to be of thinking about how they're linguistically translated, but also really importantly how um, we might interpret them in a contemporary setting. Um, so there's a sense of uh, interpretive translation and one that relates to the kind of temporal. So how 
these ideas might transform over time as well. So both Andrew and I have put together um, a presentation, the two of us in conversation, where we'll bring in things from um, other aspects to kind of try to understand what these five texts might mean and how they might um, influence our way of thinking through culture and the arts in a contemporary setting. Um, so over to Andrew, who's going to start with the first text. Yeah, thanks, Sophie. If we could uh, start the uh, PowerPoint. Yeah. So um, we do have a lot to talk about, and I, I actually want to um, dive into the text as quickly as possible. But I was thinking maybe just to give a kind of very uh, quick introduction to Kishio Suga uh, for you know, people who might not be familiar with him or who might only have a passing familiar with him. So uh, Suga emerged in Japan in the late 1960s after graduating from Tama Art University uh, in Tokyo in 1968. And probably people with uh, a passing familiarity of post-war Japanese art would probably most associate him with monoha, the school of things, which is uh, a term that refers to a kind of cohort of artists who emerged at the same time as, as Suga, uh, who had shared interests in, in using uh, raw uh, industrial materials and untreated natural materials such as stone and earth in making their installations and intervention, interventions into both um, the gallery space and even outdoor settings. Um, so yeah, I, I think, um, you know, if you know that Monoha uh, means a school of things or that the Japanese word mono means things and you see a work such as uh, the one we have before us, Diagonal Phase from 1969, which is made out of timber uh, that is propped against uh, each other with uh, stones holding it in place, you might uh, have the impression that monoha or the artists who are associated with monoha are very concerned with materialism and concrete experience. But if you have access to the writings of Kishio Suga and Liu Fan, who is another one of kind of the main theorists uh, of, of this group of artists, um, then you would understand that they're actually interested in radically questioning uh, the nature of our material environment and how we perceive uh, things. Uh, so this is one example uh, of, of, of where of what Suga writes about as as using things to deny things in order to um, achieve a, a, a new uh, perception uh, of our world. Um, and what I like about this piece uh, is that it, it's kind of very uh, yeah it's quite more propositional or precarious in, in that. Uh, you could imagine it taking different forms in different settings, as it has indeed, uh, with Suga revisiting this piece over the course of his career, sometimes replacing um, different elements. He has used wood board instead of these uh, two by fours, for example. Um, so this is a one, one work that I'd like us to keep in mind as we go through the readings. And then if we could go to the next slide. Um, here's another one of uh, Suga's uh, quite uh, famous works called Infinite Situation Two Steps, uh, made in 1970 for the National Museum of Modern Art, uh, Kyoto. Um, and uh, what he's done is he's uh, covered uh, the steps uh, with uh, sand or soil, which he's then flattened out uh, to reflect uh, the grade of the incline. And I think if you were to encounter this work in person, you would have a sense of coming face to face with sheer matter. Uh, but after that initial impression passes and, and you start to kind of really engage with what you're uh, facing, you would notice that it's all basically what appears to be sheer matter is in fact made out of millions and millions of grains of sand um, and that uh, the sand itself or the soil itself is held in place by, not by a kind of static equilibrium, but by um, uh, dynamic forces that are in tension with each other, such as gravity and friction. Um, so I think, you know, just to, to kind of put uh, Suga's uh, practice in a nutshell, um, you know, I think he's interested in 
in showing us the porousness of our material environment and drawing our attention to uh, the particularity and the granularity of our material environment, which is um, you know, slightly different from what people might uh, have as their impression of Suga's work or Monoha, um, just from casual encounters with it. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, today uh, I'll be reading from uh, new translations that I've done in collaboration with uh, the Tokyo-based researcher Sen Uesaki and other contributors of uh, statements that uh, Suga first published in the back matter of Bijutsu Techo, which is one of the leading art journals uh, in post-war Japan. And um, I wanted to show everybody the original context uh, for these texts, just so we all understand that they start out as, as quite marginal texts. Uh, you see going across the top half of your screen, um, an exhibition calendar with you know different uh, venues and, and dates and then uh, on the bottom half of the spread there are uh, selected listings for four artists each of whom have done their own statements and Suga's is in the bottom right uh, above the number 288. Um, so you know there's nothing particularly uh, special about these texts as they first appear, although indeed uh, perceptive critics did reference them in their reviews of Suga's exhibitions at the time. But um, uh, he collected them together in 1999 when he produced uh, or published an anthology of his writings in uh, association with a solo show he held at the Yokohama Museum of Art. And at that time, uh, he titled, uh, he gave the text titles, and, and in that sense, even though he uh, considers them to be fragmentary texts, he, he kind of elevated them into, at least out of the, out of the back matter uh, of Bijutsu Techo. Um, yeah, so I think also if there's a, a kind of willful abstruseness or a playful antagonism toward the reader that comes through in these texts, uh, it also helps to understand that he, he might be working against the context of the exhibition listing uh, format. Um, and then one thing to quickly note before uh, we begin the readings is there, there are two terms uh, that are kind of uh, special terms that I came up for these translations. The one is uh, the word thing in square brackets. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, corresponds to Suga's use of the word mono in Japanese to refer to um, something that is nameless or unnameable, uh, something that exists at the edge of uh, conscious recognition or perception. Uh, so this is kind of Suga's anti-concept or non-concept uh, that kind of drives his uh, thinking about his work. And he does in fact refer to his works as mono, uh, usually uh, with some kind of emphasis marker. J Japanese doesn't have italics, uh, but you know, there are different ways of indicating uh, that, that uh, there is an emphasis on a particular word. Um, and, and so this bracketed thing that I, I came up with for the English translation uh, is, is sort of intended to reflect that non-conceptness or unnameability of Suga's um, ideas. And then having come up with this idea of a bracketed thing, uh, a translation that is, is sort of suspended and, and uh, also in a sense erased or under erasure in the sense that it's provisional and, and someone else can come along and say, I, I prefer mono and they could kind of insert mono back in place. Having come up with this concept, I, I also applied it to another word that uh, comes up frequently in Suga's writing, which is ba. Uh, and this word corresponds in a, in a contemporary art context to the site of site-specific practice or Robert Smithson's site and non-site. But in a philosoph philosophical context, it also corresponds to the idea of a field of consciousness or intersubjective field. And in Suga's case, because he is drawing a lot on readings into philosophy and critical theory, um, it was really hard to say, uh, no, this is 
the contemporary art site and not the philosophical field. Um, and so I created a new term, which has a field in brackets next to site. And that kind of allows for both meanings uh, to, to be retained in the translation in a way that Japanese readers might uh, recognize from the use of interlinear glosses, uh, uh, which appear often above or next to Chinese characters in the text. And, and they'll, they'll uh, frequently these glosses will give an alternate reading of the character, but they can even be used to sort of add a new sense uh, to the word in question. So um, with that uh, preamble, I'll, I'll get into the first reading. Um, next slide, please. I just maybe before that, um, it might be worth talking just briefly about how the text evolved alongside the works, because they're kind of propositions for right. being world, aren't they? But yeah. which came first? So basically, uh, the text came first. Um, I, you know, the, uh, Suga, in fact, uh, is a profish, uh, prolific uh, note writer and and writer, and you know, he keeps notebooks that he where he kind of sketches out ideas for his works and and also writes down kind of things that he's thinking about. And so I I, I haven't asked him for uh, certain you know how much he's grabbing from his notebooks, but I think the texts generally come before the work because the work, although he, he starts mapping it out off-site, a lot of times the work only takes its final form on-site. Um, so, you know, maybe rather than thinking of it as before or after, it, it also helps to just think about it as a parallel development. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, here's the first reading. Individual sight. A thing is that thing that blocks the sight, visual field. Further, the sight, visual field, is also there after the thing. To both manifest private distances and public distances to things, and further reveal the total field sight situation by the totality of things. To gain an even more personal word by the personality of the field sight situation. Yeah, um, and if we go to the next slide, we can see the work that, I don't know, I don't, I don't want to say resulted out of this text, but, you know, I guess we could say the, the, the maybe they do exist in a translatory relationship, uh, but this is left behind situation, uh, which was made at Kinokuniya Gallery in Tokyo in 1972. Mm. It's interesting for me because um, you you um, sent me the translated texts quite a while ago, and I've had time to read them and reread them. And um, and each time I read each of the texts, I kind of interpret it in a new way. And it's only recently that um, I've seen the images of the work works paired up with the texts, and it kind of transforms it again. It would be interesting, I think, to see. The text maybe even sitting alongside other works because I think that both the works and the text kind of have this fluid nature about them that they can be interpreted uh, very differently alongside each other. Um, right. So I don't know if you want to speak first about um, your interpretation of the text or if I should go first. Which would you prefer? Uh, um, well, I'll just respond to your point by saying that, uh, you know, I, Suga's writing um, is not very punctuated, for example. It, it's kind of very stuck together. It has a very constructive uh, feel. And, and so I think depending on how you read the text, you could come up with alternate readings uh, a lot of the times. And, and it, it takes a lot of parsing to, to sort of come up with a sense that, okay, this is, is what he's trying to say. And so what I did with the translations was I actually went back and I tried to open them up to as many alternate readings as possible, um, which was an interesting challenge. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And it leaves that space for them to be very um, open and contemporary. There's something in the way that he writes and also the way that you've translated them that, um, that allows, you know, that 
them being op able to be open for interpretation means that they kind of always exist in the contemporary, that they're always waiting to be interpreted and completed somehow by the person that is reading them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think um, that is, in fact, you know, what, what I, I was going for, you know, that uh, kind of uh, the idea of the translation as a, as a platform where mm -hmm. people could kind of performatively engage with it and uh, supplement it and, and take away from it as they like, which is, you know, yeah, I think that's, that's, where the yes. kind of transition and the ratio comes from. So, um, so subsequently, I've kind of made my own interpretations of these works, bearing in mind the kind of research that I've been doing over this year. Um, and I wanted to share some of those thoughts with you. And um, you're very welcome to tell me if you think that I'm interpreting them uh, in an incredibly um, clumsy or um, inappropriate way. But, um, Maybe we can go to the next slide. Thanks. Um, so I was really reading this text. I, I, you sent them to me in the summer when um, in the UK we were still very much in lockdown mode. Um, and so this, um, this idea in this first text around private distances and public distances I think was really at the forefront of all of our minds at that moment. So it was very interesting reading this text and thinking about the relationship of that to sight and the visual field and how, um, how um, sight creates um, intimacy and distances. Um, so I wanted to introduce the writing of Helen Keller in relationship um, to this first text. So for those of you that aren't familiar with, with Helen Keller, she was um, a deaf and blind activist and writer. And um, this short excerpt that I have here is from a wonderful book that I really recommend everybody reads because it's beautiful, called The World I Live In. And in it she describes um, the intimacies that she finds in the world um, where she can't rely on the visual field as most of us do and instead has to interpret the world through um, her other senses so through touch um, and through vibration so there's these really beautiful um, descriptions of her being able to um, tell exactly what the carpenter next door is, what tools he's using because of the vibrations through the tabletop. She can tell whether he's using a lathe or a hammer. And she can tell um, the mood that the maid is in, depending on the way that she can feel the footprints, for, um, uh, them walking around, around the house. Um, and so I was thinking about, you know, this moment that we found ourselves in now as we are doing now over skype over zoom but also those months where we've lost that uh, visual connection with friends and family and the outside world for such a long time and the ways that we um maybe find ways to circumnavigate that um barrier of sight which suga is talking about um, in his text, but also how we um, use different ways of uh, creating the visual field or the, the field of sight um, to create um, uh, intimacies and, and to overcome those distances. So I thought Helen Keller's writing was really interesting in that, in, in relationship to that. And then also thinking about um, how the uh, our lives relying on so much imagery in a contemporary se setting um, reinterprets this text once again. So thinking about um, social media and the overproduction, the infinite production of imagery and the circulation of imagery as never before in human history um, and um, how that has really blurred the boundary between 
um, private and public distances to one another and to other things and to situations um, and where how we navigate the personal within that so um, maybe we can go to the next slide um, this is a work by um, an artist based in the Netherlands called Jung Hun Kim um, and during lockdown, he was setting up these situations that enabled a relationship between things in the world in lieu of being able to have a relationship to things in the outside wider world. Um, and likewise, um, during lockdown, I and my friends from across 10 different time zones would each meet on a Sunday evening to to dance in front of our computer screens with one another um sharing the one one person would be playing music and so this this um idea of needing the visual field to somehow create an intimacy between people and between uh, the materiality of the world i think is a really interesting um uh moment that we find ourselves in and, and repositions um Suka's text um in relationship to to our personal responses to the world around us right yeah um you know one of the interesting things about the the word sight uh which is uh, in the japanese uh to begin with is that uh, suga uses a word called uh, nagame uh which both refers to the act of gazing and to the object of the gaze the scene that is uh, behold in or be beheld um and and so you know for suga i think the idea of sight is is almost like an involuntary uh process or he refers to it as sort of like a, a kind of pre um cognitive uh process uh and and that uh is is somehow connected to how you know i think uh it sort of flips our subjectivity on its head so um, you would kind of encounter a sight, and then the act of beholding the sight would somehow incorporate you into the sight. So you know there would be a kind of, um, yeah, a kind of. He talks about it as a total field sight or or a totality. You know, and that part of that is is that the beholder is involuntary sucked uh, involuntarily sucked into into the site um mm -hmm. so i think that's also you know uh an interesting or powerful image for how how we navigate our relationships with each other and, and with mm -hmm. the world i think that very much relates to the way that jung and kim works actually so this is um him kind of placing these objects together that almost have that relationship of um benjamin's writing on the language of, of things, where everything has this dialogue with one another and the person is another object within that situation. That there's all these kind of relationships going on at play all the time, which I, I feel um, Helen Keller has a way of tapping into um, through the other senses, through being aware of context and situation in a way that uh, we often take for granted, perhaps. Yeah. Should we go on to the next? Yes. Really? Yeah. Okay. Um, there, but not there. One, about non-dependence about dependence without dependence, presence without presence, things without things. Two, about incline and perpendicular, about whether there's an intermediary zone shared between ascent and descent, to think about the horizontal logic and the vertical. Three, about how things are there but not there, also about things being not there but there. Four, about whether incline is a kind of conscious field site for situation to be recognized also about diagonal scenes. Five, about whether there is incline without a thing that depends. Also what the reality of an incline is. Six, about situations that incline and situations that don't incline. Also thinking about situations where it's neither. Yeah. 
<laughs> I've read this so many times. Yeah. Um, and I keep coming back to kind of scratching my head about it. Um, I think there's this wonderful and, and very true um, truism about it that, uh, that everything has a dependence on other things for the grounding. But what's really fascinating about this text is thinking about situations where it's neither, that last line. Mm. I wonder if you have any thoughts about what he means in that, in that last point. Yeah, I, I um, you know, the, the line that really stays with me uh, in this text is to think about the horizontal logic and the vertical. And so uh, maybe we can go to the next slide as well and, and just show people what the corresponding work is. Um, and so to me that looking for the horizontal logic and the vertical or vice versa is, is a very dynamic uh, relationship and, and that's why I wanted to sh start with uh, the work diagonal phase that, that that I began the presentation with, just to kind of plant that image in, in everyone's mind. Um, and, and to me, this this is it really, I don't know, uh, it really resonates with me as a translator um, because I think translation is is looking for the horizontal logic in the vertical or playing with these kind of um uh different dynamics that are that are in in words or in the things around us um so i think the idea of it being neither incline uh, nor not incline is is also kind of part of that whole dynamic you know that it could be i guess horizontal or vertical or a kind of range, a full range of, of potential inclines, you know. Mm. For me, I think it also had like a relationship to dimensions. So that you have the, if you are thinking about um, the vertical and the horizontal, you're suggesting a, a two dimensional plane but that maybe where it becomes something else is where you fold those things back on themselves, which I think comes up in some of the later texts for me as well. Um, and this, um, this um, proposition about um, dependence and non-dependence and how things depend on other things for their own uh, stability or understanding maybe suggests a relationship to um, how dimensions work within one another, with one another as well as so, so thinking about um, time but also how you get into kind of fourth fifth sixth dimensions where they start folding back in on each other so you don't have um, a set um, a horizontal and vertical you don't have something which can be a set um, horizontal um, or a set plane but that everything is kind of folding and amalgamating and contorting one another um, in parallel right. but maybe that's getting a bit too too um, spacey I don't know um, so there's some some things in relationship to material that I I initially thought about in regards to this text um, mainly because I've spent a lot of time this summer <laughs> walking on beaches collecting fossils. So maybe can we go to the next slide? Um, so these are bryzoans, which are, um, they, you find them on, um, wait, I'll go back. So, I was really interested in this text about um, the particular lines about um, things being there, but not being there. Um, so he says um, about how things are there, but not there, but also things being not there, but there. This relationship between how we might, I, I read this as how, um, how we're always the product of our context. Um, and thinking about that in a geological context. Um, so maybe go to the next slide just quickly. 
uh, at the moment I'm in Cappadocia, which is very much an illustration of that idea for me of um, there being a whole um, culture and way of life that has grown out of uh, landscape, a geological landscape that has been created um, over many millions of years before humanity. Um, so thinking about um, the presence of eras that no longer exist, of entire ecosystems that no longer exist, but yet still continue to uh, inform and shape the contemporary. And for me, that really spoke to this um, line that he writes about things being there, um, but not there and things not being there, but there, um, that there's this um, relationship to an absence, which is always present in our current existence. So just go back to the slide before. Um, so I've spent the summer on the beaches in Margate um, and there you, it's completely covered with fossilized sponges and on the fossilized sponges you find what are called trace fossils. Um, and for me that is maybe a space where it's a, a situation that is neither in incline um, nor uh, not an incline, that there's something which is there, but it has, been, has left its mark, but without um, adding anything to the world. So um, a trace fossil is a mark of something which was there. Um, it's an imprint, um, but it hasn't left a real fossil behind. Um, I'm aware that we're running quite tight on time already. Um, so maybe we should skip on to the, on to the next one. Okay. I'll just, uh, I think one thing you mentioned it in, in the beginning, how you're researching deep time. Mm -hmm. And one thing about this there, but not there, or being not there, but there, uh, also triggered for me is this idea of kind of music and how um music conventional music is sort of dependent on a limit of time within which we would then be able to differentiate one note from another note and kind of appreciate it as a musical composition but uh, you know i've always i and i wonder if there's someone who's done any work on this but i've always kind of been intrigued by the idea that you could like play a note on your piano at noon on monday and then come back on tuesday and play the next note and and do like a really a, a composition that's spread out over such a great extent of time that most people would not be able to read it as a composition you know? yes like john cage's piece that's playing in yeah. germany that's spread yeah. out over like what is it i think it's 380 years something like that uh and it changed note in September, but it was the first time for several years. It's yeah. such a long and extended piece that no single person is going to be able to, no, no human life is ever going to be able to interpret it as a piece of music. But maybe it's a piece of music for something which exists outside of humanity. It's like a piece of music for a mountain that has a much longer time frame to their life. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's something actually really nice that I want to mention about being Cappadocia is that um, there's this like dependence on this history, but this, there's a lot of history of the landscape that's completely unknown, which I think is another really interesting dialogue with the text is that um, the whole of Cappadocia was made by these super volcanoes um, and nobody knows where they were. There's no trace of them that's left behind, but we know from uh, the landscape that's formed that there's no way that it is being made from the volcanoes that exist now. So these super volcanoes, of which we don't have any on the planet anymore on that kind of scale, um, uh, completely covered the landscape, but then collapsed back in on themselves and have left completely no trace of, of themselves on the Earth's surface. Um, and those kind of things are at play over the whole planet all the time, um, which for me has this, again, this relationship to time, which is maybe not linear and um, going back into dimensions, folding back into on themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's see if we can uh, kind of fold time. Yes. Yes. So the next the... three texts, um, we are going to, you're going to read all three in, 
in relationship one to goal. another, and then yeah. we'll kind of discuss the three together at the end. Yeah. Okay, so the first text is further erasure of the blank. One, about the blank. Two, about crumpling two dimensions or whether it's possible to stretch four dimensions. Three, about two dimensional flatness and four dimensional surfaceness. Four, about a whole that can be limited and a part that can't be limited, and also about whole and part being unable to exist at the same time. Further, what it is that negates it all. Five, there's no such thing as enlargement and flatness. Six, there's no way for a stone to be in stone, water to be in water. It's not like there's existence and existence, two dimensions and two dimensions. Seven, about the relationships between distance and being on its way, about gaps that don't require time. Next slide, please. These are works uh, relating to this text. Uh, next slide, please. Tying up the in-between. What greatly interests me right now is a new ground for supporting thing and fact, gesture. Our everyday lives comprise a sequence of gestures, say, but definitely wouldn't it be odd if each and every fragmentary gesture had meaning and controlled how we live? All a slight gesture affects is just a fragment of a thing, say, showing no more than a single aspect of its fact, but from the side of the thing's existence, we could predict a single fragment or partial aspect to be in an inseparable position from the whole system. A philosophy of gestures. That's how I'm trying to think of art at the moment. Next slide, please. So yeah, this is a work from 1977. Uh, next slide. Complete to be incomplete. I'm thinking now about adding and supplementing. This is something that has to be considered only in full cognizance of the reality, which is not necessarily saying the reality is where you should add slash supplement a thing as presentation slash representation. But in one aspect, the presentation act does seem to include imparting necessity to a place where it wouldn't seem to be particularly necessary, while also making it inevitable as the field site's mode of being. To add to or supplement a pre-existing space with the thing that drags in a completely different reality, which would also mean at the same time adding or supplementing it with a private reason or meaning for why that thing has to be there. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so this is, uh, both of these works were uh, made for this exhibition uh, in the statement. Yeah. There's a lot to take in on those three texts. Um, and I'm aware that we want to open it out to the audience um, for questions, but I maybe just have a few things that I wanted to, to throw into the ring as, um, as kind of contemporary uh, dialogues with those, with those three texts. Um, so can we go to the next slide? Um, so the first thing I wanted to relate, it actually for me relates to, to all of the texts in, in different ways. Um, is this topological joke. Um, so topologically speaking, the mug on the left-hand side is the same as the donut at the bottom. So this idea of, um, this, this particularly I was related to the further erasure of the blank, of thinking about how he's talking about crumpling two dimensions. Um, and the kind of elasticity of uh, material and beings, I guess, um, and things, um, how we experience things in, in two dimensions, three dimensions, four dimensions, and how that might um, evolve into other dimensions. So this, um, this mathematical equation, um, topologically speaking, means that, um, the mug on the left hand side can be um, pulled, so the bottom of the mug pulled up and up and up, and gradually um, all of its surfaces reconfigured um, to exist as a, as a donut. So um, through topological mathematics, they exist as exactly the same, the same thing. Um, that the the kind of mathematical identity of those two objects exists exactly as the same thing. 
Um, and that for me particularly related to the further erasure of blank, but I think that also um, has a nice relationship to, to many of the other texts as well. Um, I was also thinking about Edwin Abbott's um, book Flatland, which um, for those of you that don't know it is um, a novel, a uh, kind of romance about um, uh, a being in a flat existence, a completely two-dimensional world, um, experiencing three a three-dimensional world for the first time. So going from a dot to a line to a 2D shape and then into, a th into a th three dimensions and how you know, we exist in a three-dimensional world and we find it very hard to imagine anything outside of our three-dimensional understanding. But there's something in his writing which I think offers up uh, a relationship between objects and materials that can maybe transcend um, that assumption of, of our three-dimensional experience somehow. Um, can we go to the next slide? And then in relationship to the gesture that's in tying up the in-between, I wanted to talk about um, Okwe Okwasi's um, work in particular. And she's a really wonderful choreographer and dancer. This is a still from her work called Bronx, Goth Bronx Gothic. Um, and I found something really inspiring in tying up the in-between text, um, which was about how gestures are, are fragments but that, are, that accumulate into meaning. And um, so he, I'll, I'll read it again because we read through them quite quickly. Um, so he says, all a slight gesture affects is just a fragment of a thing, say showing no more than a single aspect of its fact, but from the side of the thing's existence, we could predict a single fragment or partial aspect would be in an inseparable position from the whole system. So our whole kind of existence being this amalgamation of gestures in some way. And that for me really relates back to the um, geological things that we've already been discussing. Um, but in Okru's work, she talks about the body as being this um, accumulation of gestures. So it, the work very much speaks about how to read the black female body as an accumulation of generations and generations of black female history and how that materializes in um, a, a body language of gesture and being in the world. Um, and then just finally, next slide. Um, this is the work of Kira Green, um, her film, Eustatic Drift, where she takes that into an, uh, an even larger um, expanse of time, thinking about how the gesture of things that have been dead and fossilized for many millions of years may be read as an open score of gestures. Um, and so she, in this work, um, collaborates with a dancer, Katie Coe, um, to read the gestures of the fossilized surface covered in, in graptolites as a, as a score of gesture to have communication with the deep past in the present. Okay, well, I'm gonna wrap it up. Um, so thank you both very much for this discussion, uh, which has been very, very stimulating. And thank you all for uh, attending and for your questions. So uh, thank you very much from the Dio Foundation and see you next time.